Welcome to the new format for Great Lakes Church online and the Great Lakes Church podcast. Services now available on demand Sundays at 9 o'clock a.m. Central. Announcements available at the beginning of each service. To skip to the talk, please refer to the timestamps in the description. Enjoy the service. I know we all have a checklist that we go through before we decide on like what service we're gonna attend and if it's gonna be online or in person. But one of the things you probably didn't factor in is that if you showed up this week, this guy was gonna greet you. Well, welcome to Great Lakes Church. If we've never met before, my name's Justin. We are so glad that you're here, whether you're online or in one of our auditoriums. Thanks for finding time to be here. You've picked a really great week to be here. We're kicking off a brand new series. Super excited to jump in with Dave in just a minute. But before we do that, if this is your first time here, we'd love the chance to say hello online or in person. There is a connection card waiting for you to start that conversation. If you're in one of our physical locations, if you took that out to our next steps table, we would love to say hello and also give you a gift. Online, you can find it at greatlakeschurch.com. And also, if you fill it out there, we have a gift for you as well. Last week, if you were with us, we started previewing all of the places that our Christmas offering was going to make a difference. Maybe this is the first time you're hearing about our Christmas offering, and maybe you saw something right before you sat down in one of our physical locations that gives you an idea of what our Christmas offering is about and all the places we're going to make a difference. But today, we want to give you a look at one of the organizations we've chosen to partner with this Christmas season called Shepherd's College. Check out this video. On October 19, 2002, we welcomed uh, Brianna and Nicole into our family. But that excitement quickly turned to concern when our doctor uttered five words that would change our lives. And when he said, your daughter has Down syndrome. I w- would wonder, would she ever walk? like the typical child? Would she ever talk like the typical child? And would she read? And what would her future be like? And I have to say, I never expected us to even think about her going to college. (laughs) Yeah, but later we heard about a college for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and we were intrigued. Um, Could college be a possibility for our daughter? And for the first time, we began to dream. You know, hope was that was lost was rekindled as we envisioned that perhaps one day our daughter could attend college and uh, become independent. Um, and later we, we got to visit Shepherds. And it didn't take us long to figure out that there was something special. They had specialized programs like horticulture, technology, and culinary arts um, that were specifically created just for students like our daughter. And it was a place where the staff that we met that day, it was overwhelmingly evident they cared, they had passion, and they were an expert in their field. And it was a place also that we saw that um, our student and students can learn about God and grow in their faith. And and ultimately, we saw it as a place where Brianna could um, have true belonging. And it was funny, at the end of that tour, she <laughs> proudly proclaimed, this is my college. And it's been that track ever since. And what we found at Shepherds is that when you learn, when our students learn in an environment that's created specifically for them, they thrive. You know, and I think of one girl who, you know, when she first came to Shepherds, um, if she spoke to you, she would look at the ground, you know, and not a lot of confidence. Uh, she would just kind of you know, use that deflection of looking away. And, um, but then three years later, that same girl uh, delivered the graduation speech for her students, for her class, with confidence, uh, boldness, and it was beautiful. Just a huge transformation from year one to year three. I love getting to know a little bit more about the amazing work that Shepherd's College is doing. But even more so, I love the fact that we get the chance to partner with them. 
They have these beautiful spaces and environments that's already welcome, but they have specific needs on how we can help them furnish and make some of their spaces even better. And so this year, I'm grateful that we get the chance to do that. So if you're wondering, how do I get behind this? How do I start? It's very easy. Everything that comes in in this season to Great Lakes Church through financial generosity, above and beyond our regular budgeted amounts, go towards the Christmas offering. It's that easy. Just give and it's going to make a difference. So you can choose to give in whatever way is comfortable for you, whether that's online, downloading our app and inside of the app experience, or maybe in person using our blue giving envelope and putting it in one of our silver giving stations. Thanks for being a part of such a generous community. All right, that's all I have for you this week. As I promised at the beginning of the welcome, we are kicking off a brand new series with Dave. In just a minute, he'll be out. Thanks for being here. Well, I hope you are doing well. Uh, One of my favorite podcasts is a uh, podcast with a guy by the name of Guy Raz, and it's called How I Built This with Guy Raz. And recently, I listened to an episode that was recorded uh, several years ago with Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield, the founders of Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream. And uh, these guys are the ones who launched a company uh, back in 1978 in Burlington, Vermont, which is less than two hours uh, away from the Canadian border. And, And during this interview, Guy kept asking Ben and Jerry about their success story. He wanted to know about their hard work and their perseverance and the big strategy they had and their work plan. And throughout the interview, Ben and Jerry kind of keep interrupting. It's like, no, 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 you you don't understand. It didn't come together like that. What would happen is Jerry Greenfield had graduated from pre-med and if things went according to his plan, he would have been a physician. But after pre-med on three different occasions, he tried to get into medical school, but no one would accept him. And so he ended up getting together with his childhood friend, Ben Cohen, and they decided that they were going to start a company together. They were going to start a bagel company. And they started going to uh, different uh, restaurant equipment type of stores, and they learned that bagel equipment was really expensive. So they said, well, we, we got to change course. And then they ended up paying each $5 to take, an on, uh, to take a uh, correspondence type course um, uh, regarding ice cream and learning about the ice cream business, they said, well, let's go into this. And so they bought the necessary equipment, they moved to Saratoga Springs, New York, in order to open their ice cream shop. But before they opened their first shop, while they were still kind of getting the plan together and getting the lease settled, someone else in the community opened an ice cream shop. And they didn't want the competition, so they ended up choosing Burlington, Vermont. And in retrospect, as they kind of look back, they they realized, hey, we were a big fish in a really small pond. And one of the reasons that Ben and Jerry succeeded was because they had an enormous amount of local support. That was a big thing going on in Burlington, Vermont in the late 70s and early 80s. And they realized if we had opened in the state of New York, we would not have been a big fish in a a, a little pond. It would have turned out, um, it would not have turned out the same way. Now, In addition to kind of those things falling into place, Ben Cohen, who oversaw the production side of things, had a condition that prohibited him from being able to smell things. And of course, that affects your taste. And for his whole life, he hasn't been able to uh, smell stuff. And so one of the tests uh, for ice cream for him was texture. That's why so much of their ice cream is based on texture. It's why they have chunks of cookie dough or other products in it. And in the interview, they said, hey, there is no doubt. We worked hard. We did have a plan. Like, we persevered. But he said, you don't, they they said, you don't understand all the breaks that we had along the way. And as they started wrapping up the interview, uh, they just made it clear. They said, hey, we understand. There are people who start businesses all the time, and they apply themselves, and they work diligently, and they have a great business plan, and, and, and they just keep going and And they just don't achieve what we were able to achieve because they don't catch the breaks that we catch. Now, they obviously weren't approaching the interview from a spiritual perspective, but I just love that they were humble enough to acknowledge that there was a whole lot of stuff in play that was outside of their control that allowed them to achieve the success they achieved. Some people would look at the good things that impact 
uh, their life, and they would refer to it as karma or luck or positive energy or good fortune. That's actually what Ben and Jerry said. They said it's good fortune. But followers of Jesus, we see things from a completely different perspective. James, who is the half-brother of Jesus, he references the good things that happen in our life in a letter he writes in the first century. And here's what he says about those things. He says, every good and perfect gift is from above. He says, it's from God. And so if you are breathing today, you are experiencing the gift of life. That is from God. If you have food in your fridge, if you're able to pay your bills, that is the gift of provision. It is from God. If you're able to look around and you're able to see the beauty in all of creation, well, obviously you have the gift of sight. That is from God. If you have children and they're running around the house all the time and they're knocking things over, they have the gift of energy and it is from God. If you have people in your life and they're a source of strength and encouragement to you and hope to you, that's a gift of friendship. It is from God. If you have a place to live, if you have a place to call home, if you have a bed to lay down in, that is the gift of shelter. It is from God. So the question is, how do you respond when you look around and you reflect and you think about the good things in your life? King David, as he reflected on the blessings in his life, writes a song of worship that starts with these words. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord. That's called gratitude. And for followers of Jesus, gratitude is rooted in our ability to recognize that everything good in our life, whether it's a brilliant mind or it's a talent we have or it's our education or it's opportunities that come our way or it's our health or creativity or resources, whatever it is, for followers of Jesus, our gratitude is rooted in our ability to realize every good thing in our life is a gift from God. So in the mid-1800s, Dayton, Ohio, was one of the largest and wealthiest communities in the state of Ohio, right? A vibrant, growing city with lots of optimism, lots of opportunities. And it was into that w world that Wilbur and Orville Wright were born, okay? So they're born into a big city, and they have supportive parents, parents who instill values in them and work ethic, and they're actually uh, great parents at just letting their kids tinker and rip stuff apart and try to put it back together. And it was really the environment that Wilbur and Orville needed to eventually uh, build and fly the first motor-operated airplane. Without a question, the guys worked hard, they persevered. But when talking about what it takes to be successful, here's what Wilbur Wright said. He said, if I were giving a young man advice as to how he might succeed in life, I would say to him, pick out a good father and mother and begin life in Ohio. I love that. Right? And he's obviously being facetious because we don't choose our parents and we don't get to choose where we are born and when we're born. 3,300 years ago, Moses, who is the leader of the Jewish people, he stands in front of the nation of Israel and he gives this amazing speech that highlights the goodness and faithfulness of God throughout their history as a people group. And then after talking about the past, Moses points to the future. And Moses says to this group of people gathered in front of him, he says, the day is coming where God is going to bless us beyond our wildest imaginations. He says, you're going to have children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. We're going to grow and we're going to multiply as a nation. He says, you're going to be healthy. He says, you're going to own land. You're going to have homes and build great businesses. You're going to plant and have great harvest, different crops. He says, you're going to have herds and flocks of animals that are growing and growing and growing. He says, you're going to be wealthy and have lots of resources. But then Moses warns them. And here's what he says. But that is the time to be careful. Beware that in your plenty, you do not forget the Lord your God. For when you have become full and prosperous and have built fine homes to live in, and when your flocks and herds have become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, be careful. Do not become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God. Well, then Moses goes on to describe some of the miraculous ways that God's provided for the Israelites throughout their history. 
how he's taken care of them as a nation, and he explains the reason that God did this. Here's what he says. He said, he did all of this so that you would never say to yourself, I have achieved this wealth with my own strength and energy. Moses says, remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you the power to be successful. So let me ask you this question. When you look around at the good things in your life, whether it's the job you have or the career you're in or the amount of resources you have or the house you live in or the apartment you have or the amount of clothes that you possess, right? Whether it's your health or your energy or your talents, whatever it is, how do you respond to those things? Some people, when they look at all the things in their life, they respond with a spirit of pride, Right, these are the people who, they look at what they have and they say, well, well I've earned everything I have. Right, this is a result of my hard work. This is a result of my education. It's a result of my personality. It's the result of me working the crowd and networking and being able to find opportunities and take advantage of them. I'm the one who's responsible for who I've become, what I've achieved, accomplished, and accumulated. I'm fully responsible. That is a spirit of pride. Other people respond to the good things in their life and all the blessings that they have with the spirit of poverty. People with this kind of thinking, they look at the things that they've accomplished or achieved or accumulated and who they've become as individuals. They kind of feel guilty about it. It makes them uncomfortable. And so they minimize it and they downplay it. You talk about the beautiful house they have and they want you to know that they, they bought it as a foreclosure. Right? You talk about their jacket, or you talk about their shoes, and you're like, dude, I love that. And they, they want you to know that they bought it on sale. And they just look at everything that they've accumulated and achieved, and, and they just kind of feel bad about it. It is a spirit of poverty. Other people, when they look around at the things they have, they have a spirit of gratitude. Gratitude is when we're able to recognize the good things in our life and the source of those good things. It's when we say, hey, yes, I work hard. Yes, I pushed myself. Yes, I disciplined myself. Yes, I went to school. Yes, I, I've done all the things that I can do. But ultimately, so much of what I have in my life is just out of my control. It is the blessing of God. And this is the attitude that King David have, has in a prayer where he's crediting God for, his, for what he has in life. He says, every good thing I have comes from you. So when you look at the good things in your life, let me ask you, do you have a spirit of pride, poverty, or gratitude? Gratitude is powerful. Expressing gratitude may seem like, eh, it's not that big of a deal. It's kind of a small thing. It takes a couple moments to say, I'm grateful for my health. I'm grateful for the food in front of me. I'm grateful for my kids. I'm grateful for their energy. I'm grateful for when they're sleeping, right? I'm grateful, I'm grateful. Like, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but here's the deal. Over time, the habit of gratitude has the power to shape and cultivate our hearts in a powerful way. Over time, the habit of giving thanks opens our eyes to the goodness of God in new and fresh ways. And eventually what it does is it leads to peace in our lives. Think about this. Gratitude pushes out complaint, anxiety, and envy. Right? That's what it does. It just pushes it out. A, a, a complaint is when we focus on what is going wrong in our life. Anxiety is when we focus on what might go wrong in our life. And envy is when we focus on what is going right for everyone else. Right, so a complaint is when we focus on what is going wrong, anxiety is when we focus on what might go wrong, and envy is when we focus on what is going right for everyone else. And a life of gratitude drives out complaint, anxiety, and envy, which ultimately leads to more peace in our life. This is why the Apostle Paul, in one of his first century letters, he challenges his readers. He says, don't worry about anything. Lame. It's so easy for Paul to say, right? It's like, hey, Paul, great. Anybody can write that. Anybody can wear a t-shirt with that, right? We can have that. Don't worry about anything. That's not practical. That's not what life is all about, right? I think it's a little bit more practical. He says, okay, instead Train yourself to pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Pray about all the things that stress you out, the things that overwhelm you, the things that make life difficult for you, 
the things that crush you. Pray about your marriage situation, your financial situation, your job situation, your school situation, your health situation, your friendship situation, your roommate situation, your fraternity situation, your education situation, your parenting situation. Like, pray about all of it. And then, thank God for what he has done. Express gratitude for all the ways that you can think of that God has blessed you and provided you and came through for you. Don't just complain about all of the things in the country that you wish were different and that you're stressed out about and there's inflation and if this person's not elected, then here's what's gonna happen and if this person is elected, then here's gonna be the fallout of that. Instead of just complaining and worrying and and certainly God says you can bring those things to him. He says, Paul says, learn to express gratitude. Learn to step back and see the good and say, hey, Heavenly Father, I, I do want you to know I am incredibly grateful for the freedom that I get to experience. One third of the world's population lives in nations and territories that are gripped by repression, corruption, and human rights abuses. Heavenly Father, I'm sick and it's stressing me out. And I don't know what the doctor's report's gonna be next time I go there. But I am grateful that we live in a time period where there is great medicine and great scientific advances. Where we have a lot more hope than people living 100 years ago. Heavenly Father, I have so much on my mind right now, but I am grateful that we live in a nation that has access to clean drinking water. And I'm tired and I need rest and I'm just grateful that we live in a nation where we have, in a time period of history, where we have the ability to travel. Right, do you realize if you lived in the uh, year 1800 and you wanted to go from New York to Illinois, why anyone would want to just go to Illinois randomly is beyond me, right? But from New York to Illinois, it would take five weeks to do so. Heavenly Father, my mind is just so, just filled with so much stress right now. I've got so many things going on, but I am so grateful for access to knowledge and information. I feel so disconnected from my kids and I'm just so worried about them, but I am so grateful for technology that allows us to stay connected. Now, Heavenly Father, if you would move on their hearts and allow them to consider opening their phone and answering my call, I would appreciate it, right? So Paul says, if you can learn to pray about your various needs and express gratitude for the good things in your life, here's what's gonna happen. He says, then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand, his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Gratitude pushes out complaint, anxiety, and envy. There's a formula that most of us Americans buy into, right? And the formula goes like this. If you work hard, you will experience success, and that will eventually lead to happiness. But we all know the formula is broken. Right? Because there's a whole lot of people who work hard, experience success, and they're incredibly unhappy. Author Sean Aker is a guy who's written several books on happiness. He's given a TED Talk on it. He's been involved in tons of research on the topic of happiness. And here's what he says in his research. He says, we found that only 10% of your long-term happiness is based on the external world, while 90% is based on how your brain processes the world. That's good news for all of us, right? Because it means that when we are unable to change our circumstances, we can still change the way that we perceive our circumstances. And the way we do that is through gratitude. It's by just building this habit of thankfulness in our life. Gratitude pushes out complaint, anxiety, and envy. And what gratitude does is it slows us down and forces us to admit that there is something good happening in my life. So it does. Back in 2014, comedian uh, Dave Chappelle was on The Tonight Show and he's talking with Jimmy Fallon about the first time he met Kanye West. At the time, Kanye was a relatively unknown artist, uh, but uh, Chappelle had a guy that said, dude, you need to have this guy in your show. And so uh, Chappelle booked him to perform on a show on Comedy Central. And he says that uh, he was hanging out with Kanye and some other guys and they were just sitting around watching clips of the uh, Chappelle show that hadn't been aired yet. And he says, in the midst of watching these clips, Kanye, who again, this is the first time Chappelle's meeting him, he says, Kanye's phone rings and Kanye answers it. And he says that 
when Kanye answers the phone, everybody overhears the conversation. And, and he says, it just goes like this. He, Kanye said, no, no, I can't. Because I'm at the edit for the Dave Chappelle show watching sketches that no one's ever seen before. And then Chappelle kind of mimics this dramatic pause in the conversation. And he says that Kanye then says to the caller, because my life is dope and I do dope stuff. <laughs> and I edited that for the talk. My life is dope and I do dope stuff, right? And I love that. Imagine if every single day you took time to intentionally pause and say, my life is dope and I do dope stuff, even though nobody talks like that anymore. <laughs> I know it sounds ridiculous, but what's the other option? Think of all the different soundtracks that play in our mind, right? My life is stressful. My life is overwhelming. I can't do this anymore. I can't keep up. I hate my job. I'd be happy if I could just lose weight. I'd be happy if I was dating someone. I'd be happy if I just got married. Oops, married the wrong person. I'd be happy if I was single, right? I'd be happy if I had kids. Oh God, I'd be happy if I had different kids. I'd be happy if I had a house. I'd be happy if I had a bigger yard. I'd be happy if I won the lottery. I'd be happy if I had a different boss. I'd be happy if I had a different job. I'd be happy if God just answered my prayers. I'd be happy if the Packers started to win. I would be happy. Compare that to the soundtrack of my life's dope and I do dope stuff. And I bring this up because I came across that story about three months ago. And over the last three months, I have had on a regular basis, multiple times a week, had to just stop and say to myself, my life is dope and I do dope stuff. <laughs> Gratitude pushes out complaint, anxiety, and envy. This is why the Apostle Paul writes to first century followers of Jesus who are on the receiving end of persecution. They're on the receiving end of difficulty. They're on the receiving end of rejection. And he writes to them and encourages them with these words. Be thankful in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. 10% of our happiness is based on what's happening to us. It's external. 90% is how our brain is perceiving what's happening to us. So let me ask, what are you specifically grateful for? I know you're grateful for food and for family and a house. Like, what are you specifically grateful for? What's a memory you're grateful for? When it comes to each of your children, what do you appreciate most about each of them? What are you most grateful for? when it comes to your parents? What's something that someone has done for you recently that you're just grateful for? What's a quality or character trait about yourself that you're grateful for? Gratitude pushes out complaint, anxiety, and envy. Another thing gratitude does is gratitude allows us to find a blessing, enlarge a blessing, or create a blessing in almost any situation. So it does, right? You get around people who are grateful and it's just obvious. They're just finding a blessing in the middle of what's going on, right? It's raining. They just want to talk about how much the farmers needed this rain, right? They're sick and they got to call in to work for the first time in years. And they're talking about, man, it's so good to get some rest finally. It's so good to finally slow down. I don't feel the best, but man, I needed this time off. When they encounter challenges in their life and they're like, oh, I'm not excited about this challenge, but here's the deal. It's an opportunity for growth. Grateful people find a blessing, enlarge a blessing, or create a blessing in almost any situation. But we all know this is true, and that is the opposite could also be said. Ungrateful people can find a burden, enlarge a burden, or create a burden in almost any situation. They walk into a room, they show up, and everything is about what's wrong with the world, and everything is about how hopeless we are, and about how the world is just crashing and burning. Gratitude allows us to find a blessing, enlarge a blessing, or create a blessing in almost any situation. Another thing gratitude does is it protects us from entitlement. Entitlement says, I deserve this. You cannot be grateful for the things you feel entitled to. That's why you've never sent a thank you note to the IRS for your tax refund. <laughs> that was your money. You expected them to send it back. And if we're not careful, what's going to happen is we're going to go through life feeling entitled. And when we feel entitled to things, 
the things that had the potential to be blessings in our life end up taking control of our lives and becoming a curse. And so now all of a sudden, this house that is intended to be a blessing is, oh, it's a money pit. All of a sudden, this car that has gotten us from point A to point B, all we want to do is complain about it because of the problems it's having. We know this is true, right? You ever given your kid a bag of Skittles or a bag of M&Ms or some sort of candy, and then a few minutes later say, hey, can I have some of them? And then you see this like dilemma in their, 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 that they're going through in their mind. They're reluctant to want to do it. Why? They went from having nothing to having something. You were the one to give it to them. Now they don't even want to share. Why? They just at some point just felt a little entitled to it. Gratitude protects me from entitlement. One more thing gratitude does is it fuels my generosity. The most generous people I know are the ones who live with the ongoing awareness of the blessings in their life. And you look at the stuff they have, and it might be excessive by American standards, or it might be minimal by American standards, but they still just feel like, man, God has been so good to me. If I view every good thing in my life as a gift from God, what happens is it allows me, it just frees me to live open-handed, because I don't really see it as mine. In Psalm 24, King David of Israel writes these words. He says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all its people belong to him. Do you believe that? Do you believe that everything is the Lord's? Like we came into this world with nothing and we are leaving with nothing. We just kind of get to handle it for like 80 years, 90 years. And I know the pushback, right? I know the tension was like, wait a minute, hold on. God didn't go to high school and then college like I did. God didn't have to get the degree. He didn't have to sit in the classroom. He didn't have to set his alarm for five o'clock in the morning. Right? Here's the deal. I'm the one who bettered myself. I'm the one who took advantage of the opportunities that came in my way. It's me, 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 me. What do you mean it's God? And certainly that is one way of viewing the things in our life. The other way to view it is to step back and consider, well, who's the one who gave me these talents? Who's the one who gave me the opportunities, the creativity, the energy that I have? Who's the one who allowed me to be born at this time in history? Who's the one who's allowed me to live in this country? Only 4% of the world's population lives in the United States of America. So who's the one who's just given me all of this stuff? Ultimately, everything I have or ever will have is a direct result of God's blessing in my life. And I'm either gonna see it or I'm going to be blinded to it. 3,000 years ago, King David of Israel invites the people of Israel to bring gifts and donations and various resources uh, together and to donate them as kind of this start to a building campaign. They, they were building the first Jewish temple that looked like this. And the amount of gifts that were brought was overwhelming. People collectively gave more than the equivalent of $100 million in today's economy. And King David is just seeing all of these gifts being brought, and he's overwhelmed, and he's surrounded by different leaders and different realms of life. Some are military leaders, some are political leaders, and he's so moved by what he's seeing that he breaks out in a prayer of gratitude. And I want to read to you a portion of his prayer. I'm going to warn you, it's a little lengthy, but hang with me. King David, and seeing what's going on, he just breaks out in this prayer, and he says, yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in the, heavens and on, uh, in the heavens and on earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. Wealth and honor come from you alone, for you rule over everything. He says, power and might are in your hand. And at your discretion, people are made great and given strength. Oh, our God, we thank you and we praise your glorious name. And then David asked this question, but who am I? And David had given millions of dollars of personal possessions. He said, who am I? And who are my people that we could give anything to you? He continues. And he says, actually, he didn't continue. I stopped there. <laughs> he says, who, let, let me read this last line again. Bring that up, I'm sorry. He says, he says who am I? Everything we have comes from you. And he says, who am I and who are my people? And I love this, that we could give anything to you. Because ultimately, everything we have has come from you. That's 
the kind of attitude that fuels generosity. And right now at Great Lakes Church, we are entering our largest season of generosity throughout the year. Every year during the months of November and December, what we do as a church is we cut back significantly on our operating budget and we say that every single gift given above and beyond what it takes to just operate as a church is going to go to different initiatives which are part of our Christmas offering. And so this time of year, unapologetically, we ask for 100% of participation. We ask for everybody who considers Great Lakes Church, their church, to give and to give generously. And you don't have to put Christmas offering on anything. You don't have to say, you just give and give generously. And we've set this goal of $200,000 and we've got a Christmas offering flyer that's sitting on your seats. And for those of you who are watching online, you can go to greatlakeschurch.com slash Christmas and you can find the different initiatives. But this year, just consider some of the things that we're doing. And why are we doing this? Because we realize we have been blessed by God and now we want to be a blessing to others. And so we're getting behind things like uh, charity water. We're bringing clean drinking water to almost 300 people living in Cambodia. And we're getting behind a church in Honduras and it's a church that uh, has a trade school and we want to help finish their second floor so that they can be a blessing in that community and help young men and young women develop skills that allows them to earn money. We're getting behind Habitat for Humanity in the Kenosha area, providing appliances uh, to uh, the different Habitat homes that are built in the coming year. We're building more beds for kids in the area who do not have beds to sleep on, right? We're getting behind a uh, Shepherd's College in the Union Grove area and we're helping create uh, communities for people to get together and to sit and to uh, build relationships with each other. We're gonna continue to support Royal Family Kids Camp. We're starting a fund for healthy marriages. We're getting behind, as we do every year, the next generation, investing in the next generation. One of the things I'm probably most excited about this year, our largest uh, our, our largest. Uh, project that we're taking on is a uh, new church in Nicaragua. And what we're going to do is we are literally going to pay for a church in Nicaragua to be built. It's in a rural area from start to finish. We're going to pay for the building. Then sometime in 2023, we're going to, through Compassion International, adopt children or sponsor children living in that community. And then we're going to follow it up with a mission trip to visit these children and to see the church has been built. All right. Every single year, we have pushed ourselves and given of ourselves to be generous. And instead of feeling overwhelmed, instead of feeling exhausted, instead of feeling, why is the church and why they always got projects? I just ask you to just step back, consider the blessings in your life as my wife and I consider the blessings in our life and let this be the biggest season of generosity that we participate in throughout the year, financially. From now to the end of the year, giving as sacrificially as we can to help fund the various mission projects that we want to get behind. And like King David, let's step back and let's just pray a prayer of gratitude. When it's all said and done, say, who am I and who are my people? That we could give anything to you. Everything we have comes from you. So my challenge to you in this season is to find a way to participate. I want you to take these flyers with you if you do not have one at your home. Again, for those of you online, you can go to greatlakeschurch.com slash Christmas. You can look at the different initiatives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to pause and we want to thank you for the many, many, many ways you have blessed us in our lives. We thank you for our families. We thank you for the friendships that we have. We thank you for laughter and the ability to get together with one another and find joy and comfort. We thank you that we live in a nation with an abundance of food where we're trying to always find ways to cut back the amount of food that we eat. We thank you for the ways that you provide for us and watch over us and take care of us. We thank you for the access we have to education and to learning. We thank you for technology that allows us to stay connected. We thank you for running water. We thank you for the excessive amounts of stuff that we possess where we need closets and storage space to just keep it all. We thank you for opportunities that come our way for jobs and careers. We thank you for the talents and the gifts that you bless us with, the creativity that you bless us with. We thank you that we live in a time period of history where we have access to traveling anywhere around the world. We thank you for health. We thank you for comfortable beds. We thank you for homes to live in. And we ask that you would help us to hold on to our blessings with open hands. Help us to live with an awareness of them and to willingly share them with others so we can be a blessing to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us. But the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can hang out with us every day at greatlakeschurch.com, the Great Lakes Church app, 
or on socials at Great Lakes Church. We'll see you next time.